Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave, and I am here to talk to everybody today about coral reefs and conservation. So I want to welcome everybody to our online academy where we've been learning for the past you know, month or so with you virtually. Um, and it's so I'm so happy to be here in front of the camera finally, not just answering questions um, back behind the scenes or doing the switching, but able to interact with you and tell you all about coral reefs. Um, if you are interested in coral reefs and conservation, you want to have a conversation with us, the way to do that is to use this text. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> use this text number below 562-286-1838. Um, and that's a way that you can text in a question and we'll be able to answer your question in particular. If you want to share your name with us too, that'd be great. Um, so we can talk directly to you. Uh, one thing to remember though, uh, data rates may apply. You might need to talk to your parents about being able to text in and ask your questions or use them as a resource for you to help out. So I look forward to all of your questions and I, I hope we get some, uh, some good ones here. Try to stump me today. I think that'll be fun. Um, so the animals and the organisms and the ecosystem that we're going to talk about today um, belong to everything that you see behind me right now. So when we talk about coral reefs, um, I think the imagery that comes into our mind is um, you know, beautiful landscapes, you know, green palm trees, white sandy beaches, crystal clear water. And then when we get underneath the water, we imagine beautifully colored fishes uh, and these things that we call corals. Now, if we look at the exhibit behind me, this is a live view of our tropical reef camera. Uh, and this is something that you can log into at any time during the day. If you go to explore.org, you can, or to our website and our exhibits, you can, um, you can find this camera and you can see all of these fish. Uh, maybe this is your moment of zen during the day. Uh, but if you can look past all of these really cool fish, like that grouper uh, acting funny, um, you'll see all of these things kind of sticking out of the wall, all of these little pieces. And I think most of us are familiar that these things all over are what we call corals. But most of us maybe aren't really sure what a coral is. Uh, we know that it makes up this thing we call the reef, um, but what is it exactly? Well, if we were to look very closely at a coral, uh, we would see, especially at nighttime, that it has, here's another view of our coral reef here with all those beautiful colors. Um, we would see that there are actually a whole lot of little things all packed together into one kind of colony. So for corals, we often call them colonial organisms. Uh, something that's not just one individual, but a lot of individuals all living together in a colony. And that colony will all be identical genetically. The way that corals reproduce is really quite complex. Um, they, they spawn into the water column. We'll talk more about that later. But eventually they settle out onto a rock. And those uh, little coral polyps that start as just one little coral animal that looks like we can see a whole bunch here that looks like a little sea anemone with little tentacles, will then split apart and become two. Two becomes four, four becomes eight. Um, all along, they're secreting a shell. They're secreting, they're growing a shell. Um, and it lives underneath their tissues and something they can tuck back inside of for protection as well. But it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and growing outward and on top of old skeletons as these animals uh, divide and grow um, together. Uh, so that's what a coral is. A coral is an animal. And it's an animal that's a relative of a sea anemone that you can see really clearly here. These look like little sea anemones, right? Uh, it's also a relative of sea jellies, um, jellyfish, like the one we see here. If you can imagine turning this guy upside down and sticking him on a rock, giving him a hard shell inside, um, it would be a coral, a coral polyp. And just like sea jellies, Corals also sting. These little tentacles that we see on the outside have the same little stingers that sea jellies have, and they use that to catch food. So it's a really cool organism that we have that makes up this wonderful ecosystem that's so diverse. I think that something like 1% or a very few percent of the total Earth's surface is covered by coral reefs, and yet they hold something like a quarter of all of the fish species on the entire planet thousands of fish species, um, hundreds of different coral species, uh, thousands and thousands of uh, echinoderms like sea stars and urchins, sea cucumbers, shrimps, 
um, all living within this really tight, tightly interwound ecosystem. So I encourage you all to ask questions about coral reefs. And we first uh, got our first question from, from Gage. And Gage is asking, can parrotfish camouflage? And that's a really excellent question. So when we look at coral reefs, one of the things that we often notice, not just with the parrotfish, but all the, par uh, all the fishes, we see really bright colors, of course, except for this blackfish right here. Um, the rest of them are very brightly colored. And often what we say is those bright colors might help them to blend in with the bright, bright colors of the coral reef. So an animal that is brightly colored might actually be brightly colored to mix in with its brightly colored background. But for many of the species, that's not really true. Um, most corals are actually a slightly brown or a reddish tinge. Um, they're really not very colorful in aggregate, some in total, and some are very colorful, but most aren't, they're brown. But most coral reef fish are not brown. They're bright like this parrotfish here, like Age is asking. So why would these guys be so brightly colored if the backgrounds that they're trying to hide with um, are pretty drab actually? Well, the answer is they're communicating. So many coral reef fishes, if we go back to that live can that we just had, um, we can see one of these fishes called a rabbit fish, this guy right here, um, is brightly colored, but he's also venomous. And so the bright colors that we're seeing on that fish might be displaying to other animals around, hey, you, you, you probably wanna stay away from me because I have venomous spines. Other fishes might be trying to confuse predators with their bold patterns and colors, more of a disruptive coloration than a camouflage. Um, so those bright colors are because of the nature of the environment itself. I mentioned if we imagine, if we close our eyes and we imagine that coral reef environment, you know, the palm trees, the white sand beaches, and the crystal clear water, it's that crystal clear water that gives those coral reef fishes the opportunity to communicate using color. So because it's so clear, we can see lots of things, and because they can see each other, they now have that opportunity to communicate with color. So, so Gage, that parrotfish, while some, especially juveniles, might be more uh, actually a different color than the adults, they might be a little bit more cam camouflage, like uh, tan to blend in with some sand or brownish or, or, or maybe even disruptively colored so that they can hide or escape better. When they get bigger, they put on a different set of colors and those colors are for communication. And often in parrot fishes and other types of fishes, males and females will have different colors as well also to display to each other that I'm a male and this is my territory and here's my group of females or something like that. Um, so it's a really excellent question. It's one of those things that we get often. And the thing I hear most often is coral reef fish are colorful because they're camouflaging with a colorful background. But if we look behind me, I don't see any bright orange back here. Um, I see lots of browns and reddish browns in our coral. Now, why does coral have this color? Um, if we could, we're going to go to the document cam, and I think many of you will recognize what we see underneath our document cam here. Now, we can see the brightly, the, the, col the color of the corals in this um, video right here, but if we go to our document cam, we'll notice something a little bit different. What we can see here are the white coral skeletons, and not that kind of brown or reddish brown color or purplish colors that we see. So, so what is this? These are the skeletons of the coral. Now it's really clear to see on this coral right here, let's see what's the best angle, you can see all of these little circles are where the coral polyp would live. If we take a look at this coral right here, each of these individuals here are where an individual polyp would live as well. Now it's much harder, I'm going to see if I can zoom in a little bit here. If we get closer to this guy right here, we'll push these other guys out of the way, we'll start to see even tinier little pores inside of them. And each one of those would be where the coral animal would live. So that tells us what we're looking at when we see a coral, but why don't we see the same colors here that we see on that video that we showed? Well, that's because corals, um, oh, this is where I should have pointed out the little polyps. <laughs> there they are. Um, so so what, what, what's going on here? Well, inside of the coral, 
Now, I mentioned that corals sting, and they catch their food by stinging, just like sea jellies. Um, but, but their tissues inside of them actually have a little algae that grows inside along with the coral. In symbiosis, we call mutualism, both benefiting. Um, these little algae are called zooxanthellae, and guess what color they are? They're the colors that you see behind me right here. So if we were to take all the zooxanthellae out of this reef you see behind me, we would see a, a, basically a whole white reef, but just like these guys here. But when they're living, those algae inside of their bodies give the color to the tissues and the algae themselves help to feed the coral. Let's examine that a little bit. The zooxanthellae inside, the coral on the outside, the zooxanthellae, these little algae are benefiting by living inside of something that has a hard shell, that has stinging tentacles, um, and also they have ready access to fertilizer. So when corals eat, they digest their food, and that waste, that poop, becomes fertilizer, and the algae inside of the coral's bodies can get access to that. So what do the corals get out of it? Sometimes up to 90% of the nutrition for a coral is from the algae that grows alongside them, inside them. Uh, just, just today, I, I use the analogy, it's sort of like the corals have a strawberry farm inside of their bodies. These algae are like strawberry plants, and the coral gets to eat strawberries all day long. Lots of sweet, sugary stuff inside of them, and that's what the, that's what the algae are producing for the coral, these sugars. Um, the coral doesn't eat the algae, it only wants to eat the sugar, just like if you have a strawberry plant, you just eat the strawberries, not the leaves and all the other parts of the plant. It's kind of like what a coral does. So it's a really cool thing. And it's this association, the algae and the coral together, that really makes up uh, the coral reef and gives it this ability to thrive and grow in tropical environments, which are actually pretty nutrient poor. Um, so what's going on with coral reefs? So we know that um, they're animals, they create these great ecosystems that are so biodiverse, tons of different animals living inside them. And actually, if we look at coral reefs and their abilities to provide benefits to people, not just for tourism, going to look at them and scuba dive with them or snorkel on a coral reef, some of my favorite things to do in the world. Um, we also see lots of fish that live there and people all around the world living in and around coral reefs rely upon the fishes that live in and around them for their sustenance and for their livelihoods. But we can also look at coral reefs for what they can provide to medicines. Um, there are so many different chemicals and poisons and different ways that these really incredible animals make their living in the coral reef. And every single one of those has the potential to be a medicine for people. Now already we've discovered a number of different medicines in coral reefs that help people with all sorts of different kinds of, of diseases and sicknesses. And as we study our reefs more, we can learn a whole lot more about the medicines that we can get from coral reefs. So they provide a huge benefit to people all over the world, not just those who live right next to the reef. But coral reefs are in trouble. Coral reefs are, are declining at a really rapid rate for a lot of different reasons, and we'll go over a few of them right now. Climate change, that's the number one. As our oceans warm up, it gets a little bit too hot, especially on those extremely hot years for the algae inside of the corals to be able to survive and do the things that that algae needs to do. So the algae gets sick. It doesn't work quite right. The coral gets rid of it, throws it out into the water column, and hopes that maybe another algae, another zooxanthellae will come in that maybe can tolerate that warmer water. The coral doesn't necessarily die, but it just lost 90% of its nutrition and it's bleached white. You may have heard of coral bleaching before. This is what happens in a coral bleaching event. Now around the world, we're losing corals because of this really hot water that happens, not all the time, but it happens um, in the peak of the summer times occasionally, especially with events like El Nino. Um, and we can lose huge areas of coral reef when this happens. Corals are extremely slow growing. They grow one to 10 centimeters a year. So if a coral dies because it bleaches, um, it's not replaced 
for a number of decades. It takes a long time to grow and recover. So that's a really huge problem for coral reefs. Climate change and its kind of its cousin, uh, ocean acidification, is another problem. As carbon dioxide is dissolved into the water, as the ocean soaks up carbon, dioxid carbon dioxide like a sponge, uh, it also acidifies the ocean, makes it a little bit more acidic. And what that does is it, it makes it hard for things that make shells to grow their shells. And also to do um, a lot of other important processes inside of their bodies, their, their di you know, whatever. The way their, their, their cells work can be hurt by a change in the acidity of the water. So we can see these guys in the shells become much more difficult to grow. So that combination of ocean acidification and climate change um, are really huge threats to coral reefs. On the flip side of that, that means it's something that we can all do to help protect coral reefs. The more that we do to uh, fight climate change, to reduce our use of fossil fuels, um, is a way that we can all help, not just ourselves and the planet, but also coral reefs. Now we have a question from Melody. Um, is it possible to regenerate coral reefs that have been bleached? It's an awesome question, Melody. Um, and it is possible. Now remember, even though it's possible, it will take a long time and a lot of effort, but there are people who are working on just that. And some of those people are our friends right here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in a project that we called Seacore. Uh, we can see Danny Munoz right here. This is, um, this is him in business casual <laughs> out on Guam, I believe, uh, where they've been studying uh, coral reef reproduction um, sexual reproduction, so the production of egg and sperm by corals, um, to grow new coral colonies. And they've been, we've been studying alongside of researchers um, in the field to really understand how this process happens and maybe to also help it along. So um, in a lot of places we're researching on coral spawning, we have these little things we call, um, what are they called again, Alicia? <laughs> Tetrapods. Um, and these tetrapods are just little um, hard structures that we can use for baby corals to settle out on, to stick to, and then grow a new coral colony. And we can see some growing right here. Um, so if we look on some of these guys in the background, you can see these little coral colonies starting to grow. So Melody, this is one of the ways that the Aquarium of the Pacific is working with our research partners in the field to help coral reefs to grow back. Now, another thing that it happens all over the place in, in various tropical places to restore coral reefs is uh, fragmenting and growing corals um, with the help of, of people. And that can happen all over the place. I know our friends in the Moat Marine Lab down in Florida have been working really um, heavily on how to fragment by basically break apart corals into smaller pieces and grow them into different colonies of coral. So some of us might do that with plants like succulents. You might take a little cutting from a little cactus or a succulent and put it in another pot and it grows a whole new cactus. Uh, well, we can do the same things basically with these coral animals. And oftentimes what happens is you'll, we'll hang them in the water column, just like we see right here, to let them grow in the sunlight of these warm, tropical, clear waters. And eventually that becomes a reef all on its own. This is happening all over the world. Um, and I'm really proud of our, our folks here in the husbandry department, the animal care department at the aquarium for the really important work that they're doing along with our field partners to make this happen. So that's something that we're doing. So if you wanted to um, support coral reefs, one of the things you can do is totally learn more about them, learn more from the Aquarium of the Pacific and all the work that we're doing. Also making sure to think about um, our use of of fossil fuels. What can you do day to day with your community, with your family, to reduce our carbon footprints, our carbon impacts on the world? Those are different ways that we can help coral reefs. Uh, we have another question. What's the difference between hard and soft coral? It's an awesome question. Let's see. Um, right here, that's soft coral. And right there, that's hard coral. Okay, there you go. That's the difference. Um, <laughs> So, no, the difference between hard and soft corals. Um, okay, aside from the obvious, hard corals are hard. They have calcium carbonate skeletons, that white skeleton that we saw um, on the document camera. Soft corals, they don't have that really rigid structure, that, that hard calcium carbonate skeleton inside of them. Sometimes they'll have 
some sort of smaller, more flexible type material that they grow off of. So we see this guy kind of um, flapping around in the current a little bit more. The advantage for a soft coral is that it might be able to grow faster uh, and use less resources to do that. And the disadvantage being it's not as robust. It, it'll break off easier. It's more vulnerable to predators and that sort of thing. So just a, a different life, uh, life cycle. Now, if you get right down to it, if you want to get super sciency, the difference, another difference between hard corals and soft corals is by the number of tentacles that they have. Soft corals, true soft corals, will all have eight tentacles per polyp. We call them octocorals. Now, hard corals will all have six or a multiple of six uh, tentacles. So six, 12, 18, and so forth. Uh, you could always divide the number six into the number of tentacles that we would see on this guy. This is a hard coral here. Um, we can tell it's a hard coral because if you look closely at it, well, you just say there are more than eight tentacles, so it's a hard coral. How do you tell the difference between uh, a, one of these kind of really large polyped tentacly hard corals um, and uh, you know, a sea anemone? It's incredibly difficult unless you really know what you're doing. Sea anemones more often than not are individual, uh, but oftentimes sea anemones will live in colonies as well altogether. We have one of them that lives here in California in our tide pools called an aggregating anemone. Um, they form these big mats of, of colonial uh, individuals, or, or I'm sorry, it, uh, what word am I looking for, guys? Animals that all share the same genes. They've all split off on each other. Um, Laura is asking, thank you for saving me, Laura, with a question. How many days after bleaching do corals die off? That is an awesome question for Alicia and Stacy to Google for me, um, or use an internet search engine of their choosing um, to, to help me with that answer. But I think it's probably variable. It depends on how much food there is. I know that uh, there are researchers that have studied uh, bleached corals that they can then feed a lot. Um, so if there's a lot of food, the coral can survive longer um, than if there's very little food in the environment. Um, so we have another question about how deep are sea corals um, and, and are they different? So yeah, um, there are what we see behind me, which are these coral reef corals, the ones that have the symbiotic algaes that grow inside of them, that build the reef with all of that diversity. Um, and then we have different kinds of corals that live all throughout the, the water column, usually, usually attached to a surface on the bottom. And as we go deeper and deeper, those corals change a bit. They stop relying upon the algae in their bodies for food, um, and they start uh, stinging uh, drifting plankton, and that's their main source of nutrition. So deep sea corals, the ones that we can find in the various deepest parts of the ocean, maybe two miles down below the surface, those are waiting for food to kind of sweep by them, either planktonic animals or maybe even little bits of, uh, of dead organism drifting down or maybe even little bits of undigested uh, waste that comes out of uh, the backsides of animals. They might be eating that stuff too. Yeah, here we have some uh, deeper corals. Now this would be probably you know, from several hundred to a thousand feet down, we'd see this kind of coral. You notice it's all white uh, because it doesn't have that coloration inside of it with the zooxanthellae. And these guys are going to be strictly eating plankton. We can see that this is from a productive region because I see rockfish right here. Um, and that means that this water right here is probably coastal California, um, maybe Washington, Oregon, and, and we'd see these guys eating lots of plankton. The deeper you go, the more sparsely populated the corals would be. Um, and the weirder they start looking as well. It's pretty cool. Um, so again, corals can go all over the place. Oh, one of the things is corals can live an incredibly long time. No matter where they are, they're very, very long-lived organisms. Some coral colonies on the surface, even in coral reefs, could be hundreds, if not thousands of years old. Um, and in the deepest part of the ocean, the corals grow extremely slowly, um, have very slow metabolisms, and we have no idea how long they can be. Maybe just thousands of years old for some of them, hundreds for certain. Uh, depends on the environment, but they're animals and organisms that can live for a very long time. It, it actually, it makes it a bit difficult to think about too. When we think about how old is something, 
Um, it's usually like, when was it uh, hashed out of the egg? When was it born? Um, and then when did it die, right? But for a coral, which grows by asexual reproduction, by, by division, splitting into two, um, if one coral polyp splits into two polyps, which one is the old polyp? Um, or are they now two new baby polyps? Um, the tissues are still carried over uh, from the original host. So that's kind of a, it's a tricky question to answer for corals. So we have to think about them as a whole. You know, how long has that whole colony lived as opposed to just the one individual animal? So, oh, cool. Um, my friend Stacy behind has another picture of a deep sea coral and it's doing something that deep sea animals like to do, uh, which is glow. This particular coral right here that we see lit up by the, the uh, submarines or the, um, the ROV's headlights has this coloration to it. And then when the lights are turned off, we can see the coral itself glowing with bioluminescence, that blue color that you see behind me. Um, so that's a really cool thing that certain corals can do. Um, I don't think that's something that's common in corals, but it's definitely something that obviously this guy does. Um, and another thing to add is, is we typically see more of those soft corals living deeper in the water column. Um, if I had to take a guess, this is one of those soft corals that we'd see right here. Again, as we get deeper, things get weirder um, and the different types of, of species and, and uh, <laughs> that's a scientific fact, by the way. You go deeper, it gets weirder. Um, and uh, we see all different kinds of species of corals and different kinds of fishes and weird looking organisms as we go down. And the coolest thing that most of them do is light up. Okay, so corals and conservation. Let's bring this all back together. Coral reefs are incredibly important places. They're incredibly diverse. Most of the biodiversity um, in the ocean we can see contained in these spaces. You know, most of the fish tons of the different types of, of shrimps and crabs and sea stars and things like sea squirts and all sorts of stuff live in and around these coral reefs. They provide important economic resources for the communities that exist near them, either for the fishes that rely upon them or the tourism, the ecotourism that's generated by the coral reef itself. Um, we also know that the bioactive compounds, that's what I was talking about before, the poisons um, and the digestive enzymes and all of those kinds of chemicals that are part of the living tissue of the coral can become important resources for people for medicines. So if we have to look for an extrinsic value to a coral reef, like why is it important to people? Those are different things that we can say. Now there's also what we call an intrinsic value, just a value for just being. Can we imagine living on a planet that doesn't have this behind us? behind me? Can we imagine um, our kids, our grandkids, their kids, um, our kids' kids, uh, not getting a chance to scuba dive or snorkel on a coral reef to see these amazing organisms? You know, I don't want to live on a planet like that. So we think we should do all we can. We can do things actively, like supporting the infield research researchers like the Aquarium of the Pacific are doing, learning how to spawn coral, to grow coral from that spawning, to fragment corals and to support their growth in the wild, um, like our friends at Moat Marine Lab are doing down in Florida. Um, we even do that a little bit here with our exhibits. Um, and then the really big thing that we can all do, which is that big global issue of climate change. We all have to get together, not just as individuals doing our parts in our homes, but also working as communities to reduce our overall impact on the ocean from climate change. And we can do that by most importantly, talking with one another. I know that we can say, you know, drive an electric vehicle, put in an LED light. There are a million different little things that we can each do to support reducing our carbon footprints. But the big thing that we can do is not work as ourselves, but work as communities. You can only do so much as yourself which is important and wonderful. So if we're gonna focus on those most important things, let's do those things that we can do together. So instead of just installing solar on your house, see if you get your community to do it. You can talk to your family. Maybe you don't have the money to buy a solar panel for your house, but you can talk to your parents about working to reduce 
your carbon impact. You can work with maybe your church group. Maybe you can work with your community center. Maybe you can work with your teacher, your school. Talking about climate change is the way that we can fight climate change. So I think everybody who's listening today has an opportunity to do that. I wanna say thank you to everybody who's uh, joined us today for Corals and Conservation. My name is Dave, I'm the Director of Education here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and it's been so fun to talk to you today about corals. If you have any more questions for us, uh, you can email us at, I'll pick up the email here, um, live at lbaop.org. That's the way you can email in our questions. Um, if you're watching this, not live, but in one of the archived videos, that's how you can uh, ask your questions, and we'll get to that as soon as we can as well. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.